I think it's a very complex and difficult thing to be truly patriotic. I think it goes beyond just waving the flag. It goes beyond just singing the Nagara crew. I think to be patriotic, really patriotic, means thinking about what are the problems facing our nation. How far have we gone? 60 years since independence. But how far have we come in creating a harmonious, united country? And what are the problems that are facing us? What is the problem with our approach up till now? Adakah kita bermasalah cara kita membina negara ini? You see, in this time of elections, when people analyze a particular seat, apakah kemungkinan kita boleh menang seat ini untuk Pakatan Harapan ke apa? The first question someone will ask you is, how many percentage of Malays? How many percentage of Chinese? How many Indians? How many orang asli? Isn't it? They ask you that question. And that's not a wrong question to ask because you can predict how a particular constituency will vote by knowing what percentage of the different racial groups are there. <coughs> because the different racial groups vote differently. Which means that 60 years after independence, how the Malays see a particular issue, and how the Chinese see the same issue, and how the Indians see the same issue, is still different. Why is that so? Now, that is what a patriot would also think about. Why are we not coming together? Is there something wrong in the way we are doing things? It's a difficult question, I know. And I think we've got to start that dialogue, you know, why are we, after 60 years of being an independent nation, still thinking in, 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 in racially defined ways? You know, is the way in which we are politically organized, is that a problem? You know, what they call our system of politics, is a big name, you know, it's called son consociational politics, which means that each group has got its elite. Those elites get together and they power share. Whether it's the Barisan National or the Pakatan Harapan, you have elites representing each racial and religious groups. And that's been our formula up till now, and even in the Pakatan Harapan, we still have that. That's it. Now, is that a healthy way to go forward? Because when the elites fight in the own group itself, when the Indian elites fight for the right to represent the Indians, they got to show their Indianness. And they got to show that our Indian rights are being taken by the other. So is this the right way to build a harmonious nation when your political groups on both sides of the divide are trying to prove that they are the best defenders of their group, whether it be a Chinese group or a Malay group, or an Indian group. Is there something wrong with that? Will we get to a harmonious nation if we carry on with that kind of political mobilization? This is a question that a patriot should ask. If you really want to be a patriot, really, really be a patriot for Malaysia and build a unified country, then these are the difficult questions you've got to ask. It's easy to wave the flag. It's easy to say within your own community and expose what that community is saying. But is it easy to look into the other side and see what's happening? You see, in, in single seaport, about 33% of my uh, people there are Malays. And what I found in Sungai Siput, and it's true, I think, across the country, is that Malay poverty still exists. We did a survey in the Kampongs about three years ago, and 45% of the families Malay families in the kampongs have a monthly income, household income of less than 1,002 a month. And this is about 60 years after independence. So why is this so? And this shouldn't be the concern only of Amno. This shouldn't be the concern only of Malay politicians. This should be the concern of all of us. Why is it 
that there is persistent rural poverty among Malays? Now we've got to answer those kind of questions and because we stay in our silos, and we all say, oh, because some people think, oh, it's because they're lazy. They've been spoiled by the government. But let me tell you, just three days ago, two Malay men came to my service center and said, doctor, can you help us find a job? So talking to them, they said, these guys are in their early 30s. They've been to 30 factories in around Sunai Seaport asking for jobs. They've gone to factories putting up the notice board. They put up a banner saying they need jobs, fishing operators. 30 factories over the last three months and they've got no jobs. You know why factories put up these banners? Because they are asked to do so by the immigration department. Before they can bring in foreign workers, they got to apply, they got to open up for, for local workers. And if they can't get local workers, then they can apply to. So they put up this banner, they take a photograph and they send it to the immigration and they say got no workers. But these two Malay men had been there and asked for jobs and they don't get it. That's because the factory work owners prefer to have foreign workers who are easier to control, who can't fight back, who can't talk back, who can be bullied, and who remain work very hard. Now this is the reality that a lot of our yeah, that's true, that's true. Malay poor and also Indian poor in rural areas, semi-urban areas face. So this is the kind of, so the, the problem of Malay poverty is also linked to the kind of economic development taking place in this country, where we are relying on low-paid foreign workers to staff our factories, to the extent there is unemployment among the Malays, and also Indians as well. These are issues that I think we've got to think, you know. How do we solve these issues? How do we look into these issues? And I think a lot of urbanites, a lot of non-Malays won't understand this, won't even know about these issues. Is that patriotic? This Malay poverty creates anxiety. The anxiety is if this government, which has brought out all these subsidies for Malays, which looks after Malay interests, if this government goes away, maybe my children won't do so well. And so they will not vote for the change. They have become politically conservative. Though they know fully well that the people on the top are on the take, they know about 1MDB, they know there's wrongdoing, they're embarrassed by it, but still when it comes to the crux, are they going to gamble? So, and then they say, oh, you makan dada. It's not very fair to them, you know? So I think this is the problem that we are facing. We are into our own silos, ethnically, and if we don't reach out, across and, and, and understand where the other person is coming from, why are there anxieties and how we resolve this issue together. This is not something good for us and, and the divide and rule will keep on going. Um, the, the issue of are we developing the way we want to develop goes just beyond the poor, you know. Even if you take middle class people, the M40 they call it, the middle income people in Malaysia, how secure do people feel? Ordinary people who are not government servants or working in the private sector, how secure are they about the future? What happens after 60 years? If you have the misfortune of living to 80 years, will your savings last you? Will your medical plan last you? Can you trust the government medical services to be in a reasonable condition when you reach 80 years? Or would you have to go to the private? How much do you need if you want to go to the private? If you get a cancer or your wife gets a cancer, how much do you need? Is one million enough? Is two million enough? We all live in insecurity now, you know. The system we are having now has put us in insecurity. The way we have gone about, the way we have privatized healthcare, we've allowed private health to come up, which has taken away a lot of specialists from the government sector. Not only about one third of the government specialists in the country are in government sector, and the number is going down. We have run down our government service to our disadvantage. 
When I'm 80 years old and I don't have savings, and I have to go to the government side, will I be looked after properly? So I've got to save, I've got to get more shares, I've got to buy more insurance. You see, we want to have a caring society. How caring can we be when we ourselves are insecure? Why, why are we going the right way? If you look at our GDP, in 1970 our GDP was 10 billion. Last year it was 1,200 billion. 10 billion to 1,000, okay, you take away, you take away inflation, okay, four times inflation, take away population increase, three times, you divide it out, you still get an eight time increase in per capita income. Economically, this country has done very well. Each individual now earns, gets more, the income of the country is what, eight times more per capita income. But are we using that per capita income to make ourselves more secure? I think not. I think not. When I became a graduate, I had no student debt. Now graduates have student debts. And if you're a doctor, you probably have a half a million student debt. And you want that doctor to go and work in Sarawak, in a rural area, and serve, when his father mortgaged the house to get him to become a doctor? You want him to go and serve the people? And you put him under debt? Is that system logical? Now, patriots should ask questions like this. What are we doing to ourselves? Are we creating the conditions that enables our young people to care for everyone, to serve, to sacrifice for the country, or are we making ourselves more selfish? But for a reason, because we're insecure. We've got to pay back the debt, we've got to buy the stupid house now it's worth about what, three, four hundred thousand dollars? We've got to save for the future, we've got to save for our children. Where is that time to serve the society, even if you're middle class? Now these are the questions I think a patriot would ask. Waving the flag is easy. But to ask ourselves, is the country going the right way? What is wrong with this country? Why are we not becoming six times more rich, all of us? But we are not more easy, we are not more relaxed, we are not more prepared to serve, we are becoming more selfish. Is that the way we want to go in this country? Now I think these are the difficult questions. We must ask, and that is patriotism, and follow the answers through to its logical conclusion, that is patriotism. So it's not easy being a patriot. If you want to be a patriot, ask the right questions, and follow it through. You see, if you, if you look at what's happening in this country, it's not different from what's happening in other countries. If you look at the middle class in Europe, you look at the middle class in America, same problem, same insecurity, same loss in income, same loss in social security. So what's happening? It's not, not MO1's problem alone. Of course, MO1 is a problem. But removing MO1 will not solve the entire problem. There is another problem going on. There's an underlying problem going on. Do we understand that? Have we looked about it? Why is it, why is it that right-wing, ethnic, jingoist politics is coming up even in Europe. How can Trump win? How can Modi win in India? Why is there ethnic, racist, right-wing? What's going on? What's happening to the center ground? It's not only in one country, you know, it's all over the world. What is going on? That is the important question. A patriot should say, where is Malaysia situated in this world? What is happening? Why is it happening and what do we do about it? For that question, I'll just give you my, my assertion what's the problem. The problem, as I see it, post-World War II, there was a social contract, a social consensus, where there was a certain distribution of income to ordinary people. Right, the richer people paid a higher tax, businesses paid a higher tax, not because of the goodness of their heart, but because they were scared of the Cold War, they were scared of the right, the, the left, of Russia, of the Chinese Revolution. And they knew they had to look, they had to win in the hearts and minds, even in Malaysia, you had to win in the hearts and minds of the ordinary people. 
EPF was brought in, SOXO was brought in, there were land schemes, there was free education, there was free healthcare. But along the way, something changed. The balance of forces changed, became a unipolar world. Russia collapsed and became capitalist as well. And then there came WTO, where the richer people got the biggest businessmen, got more and more benefits where they could move their capital out, they could go and hide their capital in Cayman Islands, they could invest outside. So what has happened since 1990, this is my analysis, you can go back and think about it, is that the power balance between the richest people in the world and the rest of us changed in a very substantial way. Have you read the Oxfam reports? Every year Oxfam comes out with a report. The latest Oxfam report said, said this, you know, in January this year, it says that the richest 1% of mankind bagged 82% of the extra wealth created in 2017. But the poorest 3.7 billion got more, got more extra wealth in 2017. It's a very unequal world. And it is partly because ordinary people have become dispossessed. But these are things that you have to really got to go and think. So being a patriot means we've got to think, how can we care for the other? How can we look after the other society? How can we make our society a more, a more caring society? How can we bridge the racial divide? How do we get out of this ethnic thing we are stuck in? These are the important questions and you've got to follow through with action. If you do that, then you're patriotic. Thank you.